Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue this study on the lines simply presented. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for all the time that we have to study and open your word. We're thankful for the people who, who watch these videos. We pray that you can bless them and help us to understand the things that we are studying here this afternoon as we um, attempt to simplify the lines for those who are not as familiar with them as some of us. Um, please help me in presenting things simply and clearly. And may your Holy Spirit work upon the hearts and minds of those listening. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the thing that I wanted to do um, first is just <clears throat> when we deal with a reform line, as we've talked about, we have a period of darkness. Now, even though we use the Millerite history as our main template, we know that we have other main reform lines. But it's in Millerite history that we first see these reform lines, and it's the events in Millerite history that helps us define these way marks. Um, for me, though, there is another reform line that is extremely important besides the reform line of Christ, and one that's very, very clear and a bit more literal, and that is the reform line of the three decrees. And so we're going to look at that. Uh, today. Now, the problem that Seventh-day Adventists have always had, this is the problem that I had in understanding the start of the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, is that we, we sort of pick which decree um, that we are going to count the 70 weeks from and the 2300 days from. But in reality, there are three decrees and even a fourth but the first three decrees are needed. Each one is needed. Um, um, as Ellen White says, um, now she uses the words, I can't remember. Uh, the first decree uh, commences it. I can't remember. I always use commence, confirm, and complete. Um, but they, they all have a different purpose. Now, one of the things that... Um, came to be understood back in 2013 is that there were periods of 70 years and these periods of 70 years that mark the literal fulfillment of Leviticus 26 and with three decrees. But I hadn't really defined it that well in 2013. But uh, when we look at this proclamation of Cyrus, um, it's the decree itself that we often note. And um, yet Ellen White says it's when Cyrus comes to the throne that marks the end of the 70 years. It's going to be about six months later he has the decree. So we're, we're going to read some of this here. Um, now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, uh, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jerah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him and house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Now, when we think about his decree, most most um, um, most Christians, evangelicals, I mean, they would look at this is the decree that ends the captivity. It's involved in building the temple. And there are some Christians who try to use this decree to start the 70 weeks. There's lots of different types of variations of that. Uh, some people use this for the first seven weeks. Uh, they use um, the other decrees for different periods of time for, um, you know, the 62 weeks. Uh, 
other people do it different ways. So some of them break it all up instead of a 490 year period. Some just take the 70th week at the end and move it into the future, things like that. But it's pretty clear that this 70 weeks is all together as a unit. <clears throat> now, if we look at Second Chronicles, which precedes Ezra, um, you're going to see that this, um, whoops, Second Chronicles chapter 36. So when you go to Second Chronicles, you're going to see that Second Chronicles ends with this decree of Cyrus. So it's just copied and pasted um, into the beginning of the book of Ezra. Um, but prior to that is this section about Jerusalem. And it says, therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, that's Nebuchadnezzar, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So we're, we're going to go to the whiteboard here. Now, some of this, of course, is, is review uh, for many people who are in this movement, um, understanding the 2520. But it is actually surprising that, that not everyone in, in, this move, in the movement fully understands um, the seven times of Leviticus 26 and how the decrees relate to those. <clears throat> so, but we're going to switch here. Okay, so this is a little bit backtracking dealing with the period of darkness, but I, I haven't been satisfied with, with my presentations at this point as far as simplifying things. And this maybe isn't going to look like a simplification, but we know that we have this period from 677 to um, 457 B.C., and this is the period of the captivity. Now, this captivity is progressive. We know we have 70 years. This is Manasseh. And then we have the captivity of Daniel. And this is going to be in the third year of Jehoiah, um, Jehoiakim. And then this 70 years that's going to happen here, we'll put here, uh, 537. And this is going to be 516. So this is the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. And in this period here, this 70 years, it happens progressively. So I know it's just putting a bunch of marks here. I could have stretched this out, but I'm just doing it this way. So we're going to have uh, 607. In the fall of 607, we're going to have 597, and that's going to be the spring of 597. And then you're going to have 586 in the summer. This is the fall. Now, I usually put 537, but there is actually six months in here, a half a year to 536. So technically, Cyrus's decree is in the spring of 536. Darius's decree is in the summer of 516, and Artaxerxes' decree, we don't know when he issues it. We know that Ezra leaves Babylon on the first day of the first month with the decree in hand. Um, though Miller marks the going forth of the commandment um, 
on the 12th day of the first month when they leave Babylon by the river Ahava on the border of Babylon. And, um, and then we know, of course, that the decree goes into effect in the fall. And so we're not going to deal with all of that right now. But what we have is we have these this period. And would we agree that this is the period of the captivity, this 220 years? Now, we know the captivity happens progressively and it ends progressively. Does that make sense to people? Now, I've asked people to write on the videos if they have questions. I didn't get any one from the last video, even though we had 38 people, 38 views, nobody made any comments. So I assume that uh, since nobody asked questions, that people are understanding these things. So here we have this captivity, this captivity which ends in 457 BC. But we have this progression up to this captivity, and we use the, these as the four seven times. So you're going to have Kim and Zedekiah. So you've got Manasseh's captivity, Daniel's captivity, and the um, third year of Jehoiakim. And I guess really I should put Kim Chin here. Chin. So that's Jehoiachin. And then Zedekiah. Now, back in 2013, when I first figured this out, I did a presentation on the four seven times. And uh, Jeff was at that camp meeting and he presented the same thing. And both of us had found it out the week before that we had formulated uh, that there were four events. Now, I didn't have the dates for the events yet. Um, I had a rough idea of, of how these were done. And, but I just knew that that we had these four events that were these fulfillments. And so I was still at that time working out the chronology of the Babylonian captivity. But we can see this progressive destruction of four. So you got the first seven times, that's uh, the breaking of the pride of the power. The second seven times is wild beast shall rob you of your children. The third has to do with the siege and the famine and being fed uh, they're bred by weight, which would be Jehoiachin while he's in captivity. And then the fourth is um, a three-one combination. All of these all occur. Now, when we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and it's going to talk about the 70 years, um, this is, is addressing what happened here in 586. But we can see that 586, this period here of 70 years, that 586 is happening, uh, we'll do it like this, 10 and 11, 21 years into um, into the captivity itself. So the way that Adventists have always read this, you know, the average Adventist, maybe the scholars might have, understood a bit more about it but the way that they have we had always done is just that you know daniel's captivity the destruction of the temple in jerusalem these all sort of happen at the same time now just as we have a problem with what event marks the beginning of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days um we also have problems that people have as far as what is the period of 70 years that is being mentioned. Because if we go from 586 to 516, some people choose this as the period of 70 years. They don't mark the 70 years as ending with Cyrus. But of course, we know that's the case uh, because we are told that in 2 Chronicles 36. So that means we have this period of 70 years but we also have this other period of seven years, 607 to 537. Now, uh, the pioneers would have done this as 606 to 536. And that's because the third year of Jehoiakim goes from the fall of 607 to the fall of 606. 
And they were quite uncertain really about this history. So they didn't have uh, definite dates, but they just generally used this date and used this date. And we know the decree actually occurred in the spring of 536. Um, so technically, if we counted this, this would be 70 and a half years because this is the fall. And this is the fall. So if we went to the fall, it would be 70 years. But 70 years need to be completed, and Ellen White marks this 70 years. So again, you got you know 70 years here. Now, we also have the fact that there are uh, this 70 years from Manessa to Daniel. So we could say this is another period of 70 years, though this one isn't explicitly mentioned. It's just called seven times, but it's going to be added uh, to here. So this 677 to 537 is a period of... 140 years. And then, of course, when we deal with Jehoiakim, he's taken captive in 597. And I think the top part is visible. The what? The whatever you drew on the top. It's not visible? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, there we go. And so 597 and 457. This is a period of 140 years. That is, why is Jehoiakim's captivity, Jehoiachin's captivity, why is it a period of 140 years? This is going to be the decree that ends this, right? So we have three decrees. The three decrees end four different periods. That is, the first decree is going to end this 140 years and this 70 years. Because these two are added together, because that's when it says that word more in Leviticus 26. I will pro prolong to punish you seven for your sins. That word translated as more is really prolong or lengthen. And, and these two are added together. This one happens yet, so the second, um, the, the third one is going to be a period of, of 140 years all by itself. And then the fourth one is also a period of 70 years. That's the temple. So you got um, the kingship and the people that are tied together in this one. But this is going now. Who is Cyrus when Cyrus comes in 537? What is he according to the Bible? Book of Isaiah. What does it say about Cyrus? He's going to be the anointed. He's the Messiah, right? Cyrus is, is called the Messiah. And, and of course, there's a bunch of things. I'm going to open before him the two leave at gates, and the gate shall not be shut, right? He's going, to, um, he's going to say to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and, and that the temple, the foundation would be laid, right? So Cyrus is a king. And we can see how the breaking of the pride of the power with Manasseh in 677, 140 years later, Cyrus comes as a type of Christ. So Cyrus's decree is going to end this period of 140 years, but it also ends the period of 70 years for the land. So we have 140 years and 70 years. Both ended by the first decree. So this is going to be dealing with the first decree. And then we have um, this is going to be the second decree. And this is going to be seven years and seven months till the temple's dedicated. But I'm just marking the decree here. So you're going to have the second decree, which is Darius. And then you're going to have the third decree, which is Artaxerxes. And this is going to address 
the city, because if you look at um, the third seven times, it's addressing the city and the and primarily the siege of the city, right? The famine and so forth. And, and Artaxerxes' decree actually addresses the civil administration and later on the streets and walls that are going to be built with his second decree. So when we deal with a reform line then, so we're just going to draw this out now as a reform line. We can see that this reform line has a period of darkness. And this darkness is the darkness of what? What's the darkness that this reform line addresses? This would be the captivity, right? So this is the captivity of literal Israel. And Ella White says that during the papal period of 1260, they were just as much in captivity as during the 70 years. So this is spiritual Israel. And this is literal Israel. So these two periods of time, the 1260 and the 70, we combine them together. Now, there is another period of 70 years that we never addressed. And that's the 70 years in Jeremiah, I believe it's in chapter 25, where it talks about the 70 years for Babylon. And that is Babylon is going to uh, dominate the Middle East there for 70 years. But Babylon ends uh, on October 13th, 539. So I'm going to mark this here. What's that? So on, on October 13th, 539, you're going to have the fall of Babylon. And then we're going to have two years. Within the space of about two years, you're then going to have Cyrus. Cyrus come to the throne, and that's going to be in the fall of 537. And then six months later, in the spring of 536, he's going to issue his decree. Now, when we look at this history here, ending the captivity, it's not as clean as we would like it. Right, Because we're going to have here, even though Cyrus is the general, this is marked by Darius, the Mede. He's going to be the one who becomes the king of Babylon, even though Cyrus conquers Babylon. And then within the space of about two years, uh, Darius dies and he's going to leave the kingdom of Persia, that is the Median part of his kingdom to his nephew, Cyrus. So then you're going to have Cyrus the Persian. Now, what's the significance of having these two people marking the end of this period? Why wouldn't we just have one date, like 1798? Um, why do we have to have this two-year space at the beginning? Anybody have any ideas on that? Well, and was that co-rule, right? They were co-reigning? There's a co-reign, right? Now, the significance of this, we don't see as much in uh, Millerite history, though, though there is a complexity there that we often don't address in 1798. Um, but we definitely see it in our reform line because in our reform line, who do we have that parallels Darius? That would be Reagan, right? So in our history, we're going to have Reagan, and then we're going to have Bush, right? Because at the time of the end, and do we have any other complexities in ours? Do we have a two-year period? 
doesn't happen quite as neat as this, but we know that when 1989 occurs, um, it's still, it's going to be in the, the fall of 1989. And, and who's the president on November 9th, 1989. Right. So that's, that's going to be Bush, right? So, so, so we have, um, it's going to be at the beginning of 1989 that you're going to have this transition from Reagan to Bush. But then we also have the fall of the Soviet Union, right? So it's the Soviet Union that's going to be falling, not Babylon. And the Soviet Union falls in stages. So there's going to be 777 days from the Berlin Wall to the end of the Soviet Union. So we can see in our history, there's there's that. Now, what about in 1798? Is is it as clean as we tend to make it? We know the Pope's taken captive February 15th, 1798. But does it happen progressively? And if so, how? Because who brings about the fall of the papacy? France does. Okay, it's going to be France. But France put the, the Pope on the throne of the earth, right? France is going to take them down. But even then, there's a complexity with France because France goes through a revolution in order to do this. And we know that the Pope is going to be taken captive uh, in 1798, but he's not going to die until... Uh, you know, his, his end of his reign, so to speak, ends while he's in captivity on August 29th, uh, 1799. So sometimes we just, you know, we try to make it this really clean sort of line, but in, in these lines, there's a lot of complexity at the time of the end. There's a lot of symbolism that occurs. And then we're going to have the first decree. So we say the decree is the arrival of the first angel's message. Right now this, but, but is it a bit more complicated than that? I mean, we're going to see Darius come to the throne of, of Babylon. And Daniel is then going to be uh, dealing with Darius personally, right? So we have stories in the book of Daniel where Darius and Daniel interact. And then we know that Cyrus comes to the throne. But why is it going to be six months until he issues his decree. It's going to be six months because it's going to take time for Cyrus, uh, Daniel's work upon Cyrus, showing him that he's fulfilling prophecy. And then uh, there's going to be a battle that goes on in his mind. There's going to be a three-week period in the spring in which Daniel's going to fast because Daniel is concerned about this. We know that when Babylon falls, uh, we're going to have the story of Daniel chapter 9 in the first year of Darius. And then he's going to be given the 70-week prophecy. Uh, but then we know that he's also, in this history, in Daniel chapter 10, he's going to be given a vision and he's going to be see how there's this battle going on over the mind of Cyrus between Satan and Christ. And then he's told about that victory. And then we assume that that decree is issued shortly after uh, because they're going to, uh, the Jews are going to have to go to um, Jerusalem. And so they're going to have to gather and it's going to take a bit of time to travel there. And we know they're going to be there in the fall. Um, and they're going to set up an altar on the first day of the seventh month. So there's a lot. It takes time for them to get to get gather together and travel to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so so when we mark the time of the end here, we can see it's not just this one event. So we would call this the time of the end. This technically is the time of the end of the 70 years for Babylon. But when those end, 
uh, Daniel is going to fast and pray. And he wants to know when the Lord God will visit you and show the good word towards you and causing you to return to this place. And this is going to be the time of the end for the 70 years uh, that the message arrives regarding that. Because, But we know that they're actually not going to be released, that the decree itself doesn't happen until six months later. So this is the 70 years in Babylon, but they're still going to be in Babylon for an extra six months, even though this battle goes on in Daniel chapter 10 between Christ and Satan. And so six months later, the, the decree is issued. Now, when we look at a decree, when we look at a message arriving, in this case, a decree, there is going to be an increase of light. So. There's lots of events that are going to happen here. You're going to have this message of Daniel and the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11, which doesn't directly relate to the end of this captivity, which could seem odd, but it's going to talk about what's going to happen after that. It's going to talk about the fact that uh, we're going to have three kings yet stand up in Persia. It's going to be Daniel chapter 11, right? And, and then it's going to talk about uh, Greece. And then it's going to talk about um, Greece and how it's going to be divided. So it's it's addressing Daniel's earlier visions in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2, two right? Um, so why this, in, so this increase of light, wherever this starts, I mean, it probably starts earlier or an increase of knowledge. It happens when a message arrives. So it, it probably happens in connection with each of these. There's an increase of knowledge. But then there is a formalization of a message. Now, I've often taken this as the formalization of the message. But sometimes I've taken this as the empowerment of the message. So I would say, you know, it arrived here. It's formalized. It's empowered. Other times I've done different things. But one thing we know is that there's a laying of a foundation here, right? So the foundation is going to be laid, literally. So the foundation is laid down. And we also know that there's going to be this work of the enemies. And, and normally what happens is there's work of the enemies through this history. And and so often what we'll do, I'll just put enemies here, but the enemies are going to be in connection with this whole history um, that we see with Cambyses, false Smyrtus, and, and um, Cambyses, small, false Smyrtus, and then with Darius. And so there's this work of the enemy, enemies goes on. And then we're going to have the second angel arrive. Now, this is going to be Darius, is, and, and so this is going to be 516. But again, it's a little more complicated because you have this work of the enemies. You have Darius come to the throne uh, with the death of small, false Smyrtus. Um, and then you're going to have the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. And, of course, we see a doubling here with these two prophets here. So we can see that this is the arrival of the second angel. Now, there's going to be this progression of events that's going to lead to the issuing of the decree. So, again, we haven't, as a movement, we haven't really gone through and defined these well. Um but one of the things we happen, have happened in this history is we have this, this special history, and this is going to be the story of Esther. And the story of Esther is addressing the Sunday law. And what I've done is I've said that this is the pandemic. So this is a, a history prefiguring the Sunday law that occurs under the second angel. 
And then we're going to have uh, the third decree occur in 457 BC, right? And this, of course, is going to be Ezra. But it's Artaxerxes' decree. Now, one of the things that we see about uh, a reform line that we've talked about is you have this captivity. This is the darkness. And we can see that there is this progression of light and events that mark the ending of this captivity. So we don't just have the captivity end. And the captivity happened in a progressive destruction of four. So the way that I've looked at this is you have four events. We'll go like this, one, two, three, four. four. And then you have one, two, three messages that come and bring an end to that. Now, when the third message arrives, we also get a fourth, right? So you can see that it's seven plus one, that we have this eight, but in this fourth one, and, and we're gonna look at this in more detail later on in our studies, but understanding this, this is, this is the completion of a reform line. That is, a reform line has, if you wanna look at it, four steps that lead to darkness, and we generally say that this is the period of darkness here is in the fourth generation. And then it's in the fourth generation that you're going to have these three messages uh, come, right? So they're going to be connected. They start in the fourth generation. And then you have these progress progressions of messages that are going to bring this light that's going to then test. So it's the everlasting gospel. So three-step testing prophetic message. But then we have the fourth. And, and this is one of the, the things that we, we've looked at is that this fourth is um, a period of falling away. That is after we've gone through a reform line, there's a falling away that occurs in the first generation. So this fourth occurs in the first generation. And then you have four generations again and then you have a reform line and then you have three messages in that reform line and when the th third angel or the third message arrives you now have completed that reform line and that group of people that are reformed are then going to go through a falling away and that's going to be the first generation and there's going to be four generations and this goes on right from creation until uh Ultimately, we're in God's kingdom at the end of the world and the reform lines end. And so this is the prophetic chain as well, but it's it's much more elaborate than what Jeff originally presented as the prophetic chain. And there are characteristics that are in the prophetic chain that we've often left out when we've looked at reform lines. But when we look then at this history, we can see that this fourth is going to happen here under Nehemiah. Now, we don't really look at Nehemiah as a falling away, uh, but it is, and it parallels events in Millerite history um, in, in its symbolism. But if we think about it, when, when you look at what happened at the time of Christ, there's going to be a period of darkness. And the darkness doesn't just show up out of nowhere. The, the two things that we see that are in the darkness at the time of Christ, when he, he comes to begin a reform line, is that the Jews have become legalistic over the Sabbath. Which was... Yeah. In Nehemiah's off the screen reform, again. Off the screen, okay. Which was addressed in Nehemiah's reform. And then you're going to have this, um, the strange wives here is going to be brought to ex an extreme because they don't want to be influenced. And so what, the, what ends up in that darkness is going to be the Jewish exclusiveness. So in trying to combat the errors of the past 
the Jews are going to go to an extreme where now they're not even interacting with Gentiles. So they're not going to be a light to the nations. And in order to preserve the Sabbath, they make all of these rules around God's law so that they will no longer transgress it. Instead of understanding the need for conversion and, and following the truth, they try to protect themselves from these errors. And of course, they end up in, in a sense in a worse error than they were before because they're uh, self-righteous. So at this point, they can't even see how far they have wandered away from God. So in, in every reform line, you're going to have these characteristics. You have the work of the, you have the laying of the foundation, which we, and, and how we define this, um, you know, there's different ways to look at it, but you have a foundation that's laid. So here at, with the empowerment of the first message, and then the work of the enemies comes in. And then what happens um, after the second message? So what happened after April 19th, 1844? that we characterize this period. How about a tarrying time, right? So you're gonna see this uh, in this period and you can see this in the time of Esther. I mean, you have Jews who are still in Babylon, still in Persia. And then we're going to have a reform, right? So in the story of Esther, there is this other reform that happens. And we could see how that history uh, paralleled um, the history of, of um, the Millerites in that tearing time. And yet in this period, we have a type of the Sunday law. And so this hasn't been, we still haven't totally addressed this and how we would draw these lines. So again, this is the line simply presented, right? We can see that it's not as simple as we would like it to be. But the thing is, we could, we, we could just draw these simply, but then we're going to miss out on some of these details. And these details are important in understanding a reform line. So this reform line is going to begin the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. So I'm going to erase this. <clears throat> I just want to address a few things more. <clears throat> so when we look at these reform lines, And we can, we can go back here and we can see we got this reform line. We got the first decree. So this is the darkness. We get the first decree, the second, and the third. And then you're going to have the commencement of the 2300 days. Uh, right. So this is the 2300 days. And then you're going to have them end with three decrees, right? So three decrees, calling them decrees, but they're the three angels' messages. So we can see that this is literal Israel and this is spiritual Israel. How do we get from literal Israel to spiritual Israel? And so obviously we have these four events. Which we call the four seven times. But over here we have uh, in 677, we have another period called the 2520. And we know that this is a period of 220 years, which is a symbol of restoration. So they have these four seven times and then they have this reform line. 
Now, what is it that people often say about the 2520 in criticism of it? Because this is dealing with literal Israel and this is dealing with spiritual Israel. Now, maybe you haven't run into this. But often what will people say? They will say, God isn't going to punish people for 25, 20 years. But is the 25, 20 a punishment for 20, 25, 20 years? We have a reform line in here. Now, I know that Miller says, you know, they're in captivity, you know, through all this period and that the captivity ends. But even then, this is literal Israel and this is spiritual Israel, right? So we know we have in here the 1260. And that's going to parallel the 70 years captivity, you know, from 607 uh, to 537. But we know that this history also has a another 1260 that goes back into this history over here, 723, back over here, right? So this obviously isn't in proportion. This is BC, this is AD. <clears throat> so we need a transition. So, so this whole structure here is, is part of a larger structure. But we're just going to address this. We know that literal Israel, in this case, it's going to be Judah, because this is talking about Judah. Northern Israel is going to have its other issues. That's going to be its 2520. But this is dealing with Judah. But literal Israel is going to go into captivity, and then they're going to come out of captivity as a type of what's going to happen at the end of the world. But what do we need? to go from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. Because this would apply to the 2300 days as well as the 2520. So people will bring it in opposition to the 2520. But the 2300 days has the same problem. This is literal Israel. This is spiritual Israel. So how do we get there? We have the 70, the cross. Yeah. So we have the 70 weeks. Now, the 70 weeks, there's a lot of complexity here that people often aren't aware of. So the 70 weeks have a jubilee cycle at the beginning, a sabbatical cycle at the end. And we know that literal Israel went into captivity because of their rejection of the sabbatical rest of the land. That's why the land has to rest for 70 years. That is, it did not rest from the time that uh, Saul was anointed in 1097 till Daniel was taken captive in 607. This is a period of 490 years. There's also 490 years from when the first temple is dedicated to the temple, second temple being dedicated. And we know that this period of 490 years has 420 years to Manasseh's captivity and then 70 years. So that's six times 70, and then a 70. And we see the same thing with the temple. 420 years Solomon's temple existed, lays in ruins for 70 years, it rests the Sabbath. And then it's going to be rebuilt and dedicated. So, so there's things in here that we often don't see when we just look at the 70 weeks itself. So it's going to have a jubilee cycle in here, and it's going to have the sabbatical cycle in here. Maybe I could do it like this. Right? And Christ is going to be crucified in the midst of the week, a structural chiasm. Um, so what we do is we go from literal to spiritual. But in doing so, we have to go through this history, which is a progressive destruction of four. And then with the birth of Christ, there's going to be a reform line. Right. So in a sense, we have that first generation that has that fourth decree, but there's a failed reform line, four generations 
lead us to a period of darkness. Then we have Christ born. And then we're going to have a this reform line. And, and that reform line is going to end where? Where does this reform line end? It starts with the birth of Christ in 4 BC. And where's the reform line end? Not, not, you know, it's not necessarily where the 70 weeks ends, but it could be. Because you have to have a falling away after a reform line. So this reform line is meant to reform God's people, but there is going to be a falling away, and there's going to be a destruction of Jerusalem again in 78. And so we could say that the reform line ends in 34 AD with the close of probation for the Jewish nation. But then in 70 AD, we have uh, this event that marks the completion of the falling away in the first generation. And again, you're going to have a progressive destruction of four, the four churches, right? This is going to be the fourth church. And then the, this is also the period of darkness. And then you have a reform line. So what I really wanted to illustrate here is how these periods of darknesses repeat that reform lines occur again and again, and that they are connected to the previous reform line. Now, it's also true. So these are what we call major reform lines. That is, uh, and we've marked out in our studies in, in understanding the lines, we've marked out this um, the, all of these reform lines going from creation to the second coming, what we call the major reform lines. But even in these major reform lines, there are other reform lines. That is, in any reform line, you can take a way mark and you can zoom into it and you can have another reform line. So there is a reform line of Cyrus. That's just zooming into the first decree. There is a reform line of Darius. There is a reform line um, in the story of Esther that occurs here. There is a reform line in Ezra itself. There's a reform line in Nia, Nehemiah. So we have all of these reform lines. And what we what we're doing is we need to define what a reform line is, how it's structured. But we also need to see what place that reform line has overall. This has been one of the difficulties that we're going to try to address in the Millerite reform line. Um, when we look at it and look at the various reform lines in Millerite history. So any final comments on this study? Now, hopefully people find this useful. Again, if you don't, good. simply ask, right? So you could put a question on um, put a question on the YouTube video if there's something that you don't understand, if there's a question that you have, if you have an observation. Because <clears throat> I'm trying to make these videos useful for those who are trying to understand the reform lines. Now again, these are reform lines simply presented. Um, but it's not simple. It is, we could go into all kinds of detail. What we want to do is get the general overview of these lines and then see how these lines apply. So originally I was just gonna look at more detail on the Millerite line, but we're gonna look at this again. So we're gonna look at Miller's reform line, like Miller's personal line, and we're gonna look at the different reform lines that occur in Millerite history. So there's more than one. And then we will be able to understand our history and how these reform lines work. Okay, so um, if there's no questions or comments, we can close with prayer.
Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we've had here this afternoon. We pray for those who are going to spend time studying these things out on their own. We're thankful, Lord, for uh, the history in Scripture, for these stories, these events, uh, and the experiences of people in the past. We pray, Lord, that we can understand these things and that we can apply this light to our own lives, uh, that we can experience your leading hand. Be with each person, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.